All right, hi everybody, and welcome to our webinar today. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Ben Wortham with Catholic Charities USA, and I'm gonna to present to you one quick housekeeping slide and then turn it over to our presenters today. So this webinar is being recorded and will be available on the website in the members only portal. There's gonna be after this webinar in the next one to three days, if you signed up for this webinar and attended, or if you know someone who signed up and is not attending, um, anyone who signed up will receive um, a recording of the webinar and the PDF slides to your email. And it'll be from the GoToWebinar system. Your phone lines and computer speakers are gonna be muted throughout the webinar. And we'll have question and answer time at the end of the presentation. And then to keep it really simple, let's, for questions, please just use the question box. Um, we're not gonna unmute anybody today. Um, so please use the question box and submit your questions as we go through. And thank you so much. And I'm gonna hand it over to Scott. Great, and thank you for every everyone for joining us. This is Scott Hurd, also with Catholic Charities USA. One little clarification on that slide. Um, this webinar will be available on the website, but it will be in the Parish Social Ministry Resources section, which is available to, to everyone, the public. So if there are folks um, in parishes um, or those outside Catholic Charities you'd like to share this with, you may do so and they'll be able to access this information. Um, very um, excited and honored to introduce our presenters um, today. Um, first of which is um, Deborah Michael John, who is a faith community nurse educator um, in Arkansas. And uh, she was a, um, a, a nurse for 31 years, has a master's degree in nursing, has taught at the university um, level. And in her so-called retirement, and you'll, you'll find out why I call it so-called, she has done um, great things implementing a program um, that originated in Catholic Charities of the Archdiocese of Oklahoma City. And we have two individuals with us from Oklahoma City. Um, first is Brian Smith, um, who is the director of parish engagement at that Catholic Charities Agency, and also his predecessor, um, Becky Van Pool, um, who was the originator and creator of the Faith Community Nursing Formation Program, which Deborah exported to Little Rock. And I'm very excited from the Catholic Charities perspective to lift this up because I think it's a model that can be replicated um, elsewhere. Um, it provides a, a great opportunity for transition of care of um, individuals who are transitioning back home um, after having been hospitalized. And it does also involve engagement with a local Catholic healthcare system, which is another really important element. So without any further ado from me, um, I will pass on the baton to our presenters. Thank you, Scott. Um, we're going to open up first with a short prayer. Then this is a blessing for all who serve in the Ministry of Healthcare. May rest find you in the peaceful moments when all is still, in the quiet times when you pause and breathe. May rest find you in the chaos of the moment, in the sorrow you seek to heal. May rest bless you and strengthen you. May it fill your spirit and give you unearned joy. May you find rest in the care of others, in the knowledge of your worth, the value of your service. And may the one who gives rest bless you and hold you close. And may you in your very being be a place of rest for others. Amen. I'm just gonna talk a little bit about faith community nursing and for me, this was a is a calling. Let me see how. Do we go to the next slide? There we go. Okay. Now I was taking uh, at the Diocese of Little Rock. I was in the Theology Institute program, and during our third year there, they had asked us what our goal was when we finished the institute here, how we were going to implement some what we had learned during the courses. And I had thought about parish nursing, not really knowing how much was information was available out there at the time. So I talked with my priest 
and we got I got his approval and we got some information on Paris nursing and established a faith and health ministry at um, at our church. Um, we started that in, in January and then in October of that year I attended the faith community nursing foundations course, which is by the Westberg Institute and I attended out at the Archdiocese of Oklahoma City. Okay. And this, our initial committee members, as you can see, are made up of a lot of different professions. We had doctors, social workers, nurses, administrators, and they, they, all of these professions are who oversee the ministry and they determine what events that we're going to be doing that year for our um, parish community. One of the first things that we worked on uh, next are our mission statement and our goals and the mission statement we adopted from Catholic Charities at Oklahoma City from one of their um, web pages and then our goals we worked on um, was they were written by our committee and we wanted to um, see what was available out there what we needed to do one thing we do recommend is when you do your goals you check to see what other things are already being done at your parish um, possibly, it, you don't want to repeat it, but it might be something that you can incorporate into your ministry. You may have people like that are already sending cards out to people that have been in the hospital or making some visits to people in the home. So these were some things that we did and we just put together this list of goals for our parish that we were going to work on. Okay. So what is faith community nursing? Well, it's also been known, you may have heard it as parish nursing or church nursing. And of course, nursing goes back way before uh, the birth of Christ back into the Stone Age. But Dr. Granger Westberg um, conceptualized it back in the 70s, and they actually had put piloted the program and then started their own foundations course back in 1997. And at the same time, the American Nurses Association recognized faith community nursing as a nursing specialty, and they developed the scope and standards of practice for faith community nurses. The next page. So faith community nursing actually combines professional nursing and the health faith community. And the spirituality is a key role of the faith community nurse where we actively promote the wellness, wholeness, and preventive health. Um, in the foundations course, you really gain an understanding of the theoretical knowledge necessary. We review the professionalism. We look at the holistic picture of the patient or the client that we visit um, from spiritual through physical, social, psychological. We identify networks in the community, continuing education and support for our nurses and even for our faith community. And then the spirituality, which is a big part of it. Um, one of the things that we do when we get the um, before we start the courses, we have everybody um, complete a pre-spiritual assessment of their values. Because really a faith community nurse, we just share Christ's love in our hearts with those that who need love. So we're really an extension of God's unconditional love through the corporal works of mercy. So you need to learn, the nurses learn to take care of themselves first so they can serve others. And I got like St. Bernard of Clairvaux, it said, they must act as a reservoir by filling themselves first with spiritual fullness and love, then sharing the excess of these gifts with others. You know, people are out there, they're lonely and they need someone to talk to. And especially during this pandemic, they don't have somebody close by that can just hold their hand. So we can make phone calls and talk to them and keep them posted as what's going on out there. Um, one of the visits that I made was to a gentleman at an assisted living center and he has no family in this area. He has one niece that lives out in California, but he would call every now and then. And we were talking and I noticed above the door, um, he had a medal of St. Benedict. So I asked him if he would happen to be an Oblate. And it turned out that he used to be a monk out at our Abbey up here and had gone into a retirement facility and had been moved around a number of times. So after I had talked to him, I asked him if I had the permission to notify the Abbey because apparently when I called them, they had been looking for him and didn't know, you know, where he had been moved to. And so then one of the monks came down and actually visited with him down here. And he was very surprised and happy with that. So they've been keeping in touch with him. Most faith community nurses work alone. 90% of them are a voluntary position. 
and they see this as an opportunity to be able to share their compassion and humility with others. A lot of them that do it are retired. And that's when I got into it. My goal was I wanted something to keep me busy when I retired. And this has kept me busy and it keeps going. <laughs> um, so I had a friend, as just to show you how we can be an advocate for patients, a friend of mine who was visiting with one of our parishioners and she would go every day to visit with her. And it turned, she was gonna have to cut back her hours. So she had called me and asked me to talk to this particular parishioner. And I called her and it's like, it was the next day and the lady just started crying. She's like, oh my gosh, I've been praying. And I mean, and you called me. So I went to visit with her and I took her some information of different agencies in town that provided services in the home. And we kind of reviewed the information and that, but I let her make the phone calls and her talk to the agencies and talk about costs and the frequency and everything. And so she set that up. And one of the things that she did that she was gonna miss when this person came every day was in the afternoon, they made her coffee. So we rearranged her kitchen because she was wheelchair bound. So she couldn't get to a lot of places or reach it. So we just rearranged her kitchen so she could do things for herself. And um, then she would have these people come in three times a week. And then her daughter was there on the weekend. She learned how to transfer and everything. But the biggest thing was she came back to church. And when I saw her back at church, that just made me feel good because I, she started to take um, independence for what she was doing and not relying on somebody else to do everything for her. Um, we also can be an educator for our parishioners if they need information on certain topics. We have a magazine rack where we keep information out every month on different topics, diabetes, heart disease. And then also in this type of program, you have a faith community nurse who oversees the program, but you may have other nurses or lay people that want to go and make home visits for you. So we did a class, a special class and set it up and just reviewed infection control, um, confidentiality, communications, um, and just how to make them feel more comfortable when they went to make a home visit. So um, when we started the ministry, um, the first thing that we did was um, talk to the congregation about the ministry to let them know what it was. And then we started an initial survey just to find out what the needs and wants were for our parish. Now, every parish is going to be different. So based on age, um, ours is a, has an older population, but those with schools are going to have a younger, uh, younger population because they're going to have families and young children. So their needs and wants might be different. So that kind of gives you an idea of where to work towards um, on events that you can plan during the year. Parishioners, you need to be aware they're going to be kind of slow to respond at first, especially to something that's new. So they have to um, adapt to it and then they have to learn to earn your trust. So you, and the first year, I always tell people don't commit to too many activities the first year because you don't want to overextend yourself and not be available um, or not be able to fulfill your commitments. So we usually we did the first year we did the survey and in the fall we do a health fair. And we do on our health fairs, we have, because of flu shots, we are not able to administer shots as a faith community nurse. We have a pharmacist come in and they administer our flu vaccines for us. And then we have physician assistants who come in that are in school with their instructors and they do our blood glucose checks and blood pressure checks. And then they're available to provide instruction and education to the parishioners as they identify people that are in need. Our local EMS has also come in and especially to our head ushers taught CPR and first aid. And one of our um, parishes here in town actually have somebody at each mass identify who is gonna be the lead person if for something somebody passes out or faints or whatever, so that they go and identify that one person that will make the calls. Because usually every parish has got a number of people that are healthcare workers, but this way you have one person to contact and then they can have other people come in and identify who needs to call 911, you know, who gets the first aid kit, whatever. Um, so it's not, so everyone's not trying to run it. You have one person. 
Um, one thing that we were working on before the pandemic started was with our local university hospital in the geriatrics department. They actually have where they do weekly exercise classes and they will actually come to the parish and do classes for our parishioners. So that's something that we're gonna be working on probably this next year once a lot of these restrictions are lifted. Um, we can go a couple slides. Um, when we make our home visits, you can go one more. Most people are homebound and isolated and they're very lonely and they just need somebody to talk to. So we rely on our Eucharistic ministers a lot of times who go and visit with them on Sunday to make referrals to us of people they visited with that really need someone to come in and talk to them. One of the first things that we do when we make our home visit is we have them sign a confidentiality agreement, just letting them know that what they discuss with us will not be discussed with anybody else unless they put their name on this list. Now we usually, or, or unless they indicate to us they're gonna harm themselves or others. But we always try to get the priest's name on there in case for some reason we need to have them come in. And usually some of their family members, if they want, will put on there. But um, in home visits, it's also, um, they have to learn how to develop a trust with us when we come in because we're new, we're out from outside coming into their home. We've had patients, I've gone and visited them the first time and they've had um, a family member there or they may have had a neighbor or somebody else there with them. So um, just because they don't know who we are and you know they're relying on us to come in. So one of the things that we developed was a little bookmarker and it lists our mission and goals on one side and on the back side, it lists the members of the committee and then our church information and then we sign it and leave that with them so they know who it was that came to visit with them. And then if they have any questions, they can call the church office. And we usually recommend, you know, you call ahead um, a couple of days and make an appointment for a two hour window and then call and confirm the appointment the day of the visit. And then at that point, you usually ask them if there is anybody else that you need to notify. If they have um, a son or daughter in town that would want to be there when we make our visits. One of the other things that is required on these visits is documentation. So we do require or recommend that the faith community nurse make the first visit so they can go in and assess the patients and the, the environment and see what services are required. Um, we've had people that we visited with who um, the husband was taking care of his wife 24 seven, she had Alzheimer's. And you know we could send somebody in and relieve him for a couple hours so he could go out and maybe have lunch with some friends or get a haircut or just do some personal things that he may not get time to do. Uh, usually on our second visit, we have a parishioner who makes prayer shawls and we'll go and take the prayer shawls out to them on the second visit. And we attach to them a little card that says, um, our, it's hug, called Hugs from God. And we put Isaiah 66, 13 on the back, which says, as a mother comforts her child, so I will comfort you. In Jerusalem, you shall find your comfort. And then when I make the follow, if I make follow-up visits with these ladies, they will always have their prayer shawl out when they know we're coming to visit with them. So it's when we do it, it's very special for them. And usually they want to be there and they want to talk, you know, sometimes for an hour or more, um, just about things in general. We do, um, have different prayer cards that we take that we can share with them and some of these these are some excerpts here from some prayer cards and we got these from catholic health association and people who are non-members can get an order cards like this too and they can get them for free and sometimes we'll take those in with them and share with them but the prayer um, at our visit is something that we leave up to the parishioner you know some of them are very private and they want to do their own um, prayer time on their own in private. Others may want to do a rosary. So we kind of ask them if they want to pray and um, help them make the decision so they feel comfortable. But you want them to be relaxed and be able to feel that they can talk to you about anything. Some of them might have questions. Sometimes we go in about um, end of life situations or spirituality. And sometimes that prompts the question if you know they want to talk to a priest. A couple of times I've made home visits and some of our, and one of our seminarians actually went with me on the home visit and they really appreciated that because they would ask him a lot of questions and talk to him. And we usually stay most visits about an hour. 
Now, there are some tasks that nurses are not, faith community nurses are not able to do. And these are really anything that require a physician order, like giving injections, any type of invasive procedures, um, any kind of medical care. Um, it, we did get a letter of exception this year for the pandemic to be able to administer the COVID vaccine shots for our parishes. Um, but these restrictions apply and they are also in the scope and standards of practice. So we know that, you know, and it's strictly for faith community nurses. Um, and then um, now the act, these actions will only apply, I think it's on the next screen. These actions will only apply um, when you're at your particular parish. So if you're a faith community nurse representing your parish, these are things you cannot do. But if you go and give flu shots like with St. Vincent's and we go out to the homeless shelters and stuff, you're actually working under St. Vincent. So the faith community nurse title does not apply and these guidelines don't apply. Okay, we do, um, we'll go to the next slide. Some collaboration with St. Vincent's and we started that. It's well, this we're going into our second year now, and um, Michael Millard, who is a market director for mission integration at St. Vincent's, he does our talks on legal and ethical issues when we have our foundations course. This past fall, we did flu vaccine clinics with them for the underserved, uh, underinsured and homeless. And then we actually just finished last weekend our first round of COVID vaccine clinics. And they're in, a, in the process of developing a transitional care program from hospital to home. The COVID vaccine clinics that we did, um, we actually established four parishes in the Little Rock area and assigned different parishes to those and advertised for a few weeks. We can go to the next slide. Advertised for a few weeks the, um, that we would be having them and then scheduled appointments. And then we also advertised for volunteers and we had a number of physicians and nurses that volunteered to help and others that helped just with the paperwork and the process. And really, if it wasn't for all the volunteers we had, it wouldn't have been as successful as it was, but the flow went great. Um, we had really no problems. What was really rewarding was to see the people when they got their first shot, that relief on their face, they just felt some comfort knowing that they've got their first COVID shot. We had we give them little stickers with times on it so they know when their 15 minute wait time is up. We have people taking selfies of themselves with their stickers and their little cards and posting them on Facebook. So, but it was, it was very rewarding to see them and see how appreciative they were when they were exiting out and telling us that thankful that they were able to get the vaccine. Um, some of the future programs that we're working on with um, CHI is a transitional care program. And they work with Common Spirit, which is part of CHI. And they are wanting, they're providing another option for community-based care. Oh, we can go to the next slide. Community-based care for people as they transition from the hospital back to the home. And as a faith community nurse, we would be able to just follow up with them in the home and make sure that these people understand their discharge instructions and they don't have any questions. You know, patients are discharged earlier nowadays than they used to be with a higher acuity level than before. Many of them require home health services. So a faith community nurse just really provides another set of eyes on these individuals to monitor after discharge and observe for any complications or behavioral changes. And the whole goal is just to prevent a hospital readmissions. So um, to get into the program, the social worker, and this is still like in the planning stages, but we are talking about having them go in and provide this option to them, to the parishioner. And so they can opt in or opt out. It's not like everyone that gets discharged, we're gonna have someone go visit them. But if they say, yes, I wanna have a faith community nurse from my parish come visit me, then we will be able to send somebody out to see them and just review their discharge instructions and medications with them and make sure they understand where they are. You know, sometimes if they know the faith community nurses say that in itself will just help decrease some stress and anxiety as they transition. Um, most people, when they get discharged from a hospital, you know, they're gonna hear about the first five minutes of their discharge instructions and the rest of it's gonna go over their head. Um, and they're just still trying to absorb what they've already heard. You know, I, I don't know if most of you know, but most discharge instruction packets can be anywhere from 20 to 30 pages long. 
which include information about the disease process or the diagnosis or any medication instructions. So it's good to be able to go back with them and point out the things that they need to know. Or we can go to the next slide. Um, and just review these with them. You know, myself, I had a procedure a few years ago and I really knew what I needed to do. But honestly, it wasn't until day three that I even went back and looked at my discharge instructions. So if I don't, you know, people that go home, they may or may not even look at them again. So if you come in and just review with them saying, you know, no, you can't lift anything heavy for a while or, you know, your diet or your medications, they've changed this medication, you're not on this one anymore. You can review things like that with them. Our overall goal, though, is to prevent 30-day hospital readmissions because um, that is a quality improvement initiative for hospitals where they really, they can get, if patients come back in within 30 days, sometimes the, the care that they provide is not necessarily covered. And then we want to prevent uh, or look at elder care. Um, the National Council on Aging, by 2035, there will be more older adults than there will be children. And the Catholic Health Association says that whatever can be done must be done to make it possible for the elderly at risk to remain self-sufficient and participating members of their community. So we wanna protect them, we wanna check on them, make sure that they're not being taken advantage of or abused. And if they have appointments, follow-ups, make sure that they go to their appointments and they go to their follow-ups. Um, I had a friend contact me about um, one of our parishioners who was having some difficulty breathing and asked if I'd go visit with her. So I did, and she had just been two weeks prior she had been discharged from a rehab facility and turned out that rehab facility here in Little Rock had had a number of COVID positive cases already. So, you know, we were wondering, well, you know, is she getting COVID or not? So we went and worked with her and she called her physician and then we got her set up on telehealth and she didn't know how to do it. So I was able to stay with her and help her set up the telehealth and be able to talk to the nurse and explain to her the symptoms she was experiencing and how she felt. And then they schedule an appointment for her the next morning where her son actually took her over to get COVID tested. And the test actually came back negative, and she, but she was diagnosed with congestive heart failure. But those are just some of the things, because a lot of them are not, you know, computer, they can't work with computers that well, or even on their phones when they have to do telehealth. Sometimes they just need help like that. And working with other home health agencies. And, um, you know, research has shown that stress and anxiety can be decreased when you have somebody in the home that you already know. Um, because even if you have home health come in, you know, you have a new person, but if you have a faith nurse come in that you know at your parish, you can ask them questions and talk to them about things that you might be afraid to ask the home health nurse. Or we can go um, a couple slides. When we first started out, um, our ministry, we didn't have a budget to work on. So we applied for some grants and um, yeah, one more. And so the grants that we received came from Respect for Life, our Catholic Charities here in Little Rock, Our Lady of Good Counsel and the Blue and You Foundation. And with most of that money, we established an educational partnership with Catholic Charities and the Westberg Institute to be able to teach the foundations course for the next five years. So what our goal is here in Arkansas is to share this program with parishes around the state and hopefully help other parishes set up a ministry like this where they are able to um, help some of their parishioners in their community. Because these people who um, are lonely and isolated and just need your time and really they just need to know that they're not forgotten. And with uh, I've got the resources there at the end. And do we have any questions? I went through that pretty quick, so I'm sorry. I have a yeah. quick, quick question for you. Um, yeah. The this is simple, but the geriatric classes. I mean, uh -huh. are, are they free? And have yeah. Have, have you seen them before? I mean, have they come out? Yeah, it's through um, UAMS at their geriatric clinic. Uh -huh. And they will come out to your parish and they will do uh, exercise class like they're free once a week, like Tai Chi or whatever you want. And yeah, they're free. Totally free. Wow. Mm -hmm. We have one of our um, 
one of our parishes in Hot Springs has already been doing it, and at, they started back up this summer, and they've got their chairs all spaced out, and they were wearing their masks and everything. But we're we're waiting until you know we get past a lot of this, and then we're going to contact them again and get them set up. But I think we have a lot of people there that really would be interested in that, and um, just for balance, especially as you get older, you know, for strength and balance. And it uh, looks like we have somebody raising their hand. If if um, we're not going to do any unmuting, but if you could put your question into the question box, that would be awesome. Any other questions from the audience today? Any anything from Brian Smith? Oh, we got a question. Um, let's see. Are there nurses, RNs, or LPN? Um, well, the the faith community nurse needs to be an RN, but an LPN or lay people can also take the course, and then they would get the title of health minister and can also work under the program, but they don't have to go through the program, but you do need to have an RN. Um, that at least has a bachelor's degree to be um, in charge or coordinating the program at the parish. One of our goals, and I didn't really talk about this, is once we get some parishes up and established, is to kind of set work, set up a network program where um, our nurses can talk with each other and possibly meet, you know, once a year and just kind of learn what other parishes are doing and find out if it's something that they would want to take back to their parish. Debbie, I was going to ask you how many um, parishes are doing it. Are is it just yours right now? Well, actually, we have we had five that we did this summer. Um, so we we have ours. We've got one in Mountain View and Hot Springs, and then we have um, Christ the King in Little Rock that's interested in taking a class, going to the class this spring. Um, and then we're gonna we have classes scheduled in July for Springdale. And we're going to go to Texarkana in September and Jonesboro in no October, November. They wanted oh, us to kind of set it up by deanery, so we kind of go around the state and make it easier for the nurses to attend so they don't have to travel so far. That's, that's wonderful. Glad to hear that. Just in Oklahoma, we do have a, a association, a Faith Community Nurses Association and of Oklahoma, and they meet quarterly and have like they have a, a business meeting and then um they have they sponsor then in the afternoon they have an education presentation which has um if people want to get the continue education um, training they can get their continuing education training and to keep up their certifications and then they once a year will have a conference um, and this year we actually they actually did the conference uh, via Zoom and participated and had, had, have, there's probably about, oh, I'd say there's probably 50 or 60 members. Uh, and it's from all denominations, not just the Catholic community, but from all different types of denominations. A nursing association here in Arkansas is kind of a long-term goal for us, but we've got to really get established the core nurses. And, you know, I, I would like to have, like, when this pandemic came up and they said they wanted us to start doing the COVID vaccines, I mean, we had nurses that have applied. And, you know, if we had this, we would have people that we could draw from to help, because they're talking about going out to some of the different rural areas and doing these clinics also. So we would have mm -hmm. people there that we could already contact that could help us on the other end, you know, get things set up. All right, we have two. Well, you, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I would say you've done a wonderful do job, and, and it's, uh, it's just been a very good presentation. Oh, thank you. When, when I finished my course over there, Becky to asked me if I would bring this to Arkansas. So that's been one of my goals, is to bring this program here <laughs> for her. All right, we have three uh, people who put, put through um, questions and responses. So the first one is, you mentioned having a consent conf confidentiality agreement signed during the first visit. Do you have an attorney who mm -hmm. developed this form or a resource for a template? Also, 
do you require volunteers to sign a confidentiality agreement? Yes, we got the template um, through the Faith Community Nursing Program, but I do did send it through our attorney um, at the diocese and he reviewed all of them and approved the forms that we use. And we do have a confidentiality form that people that go in, in the home and visit with different parishioners sign and also everybody on our um, team, on our ministry team will sign a confidentiality agreement also. And then, um, are any of these programs available outside your state? Actually, Faith Community Nursing is available. There's a lot of places around the country where they have it. I've, I've seen that they have it. Um, the Westberg Institute, which is in Memphis, is who, kind of, who oversees the program. Um, but they will post on their website different classes that are going on around the state or around the country if people you know, are interested. And then there's a, uh, um, a comment that came through from Tom Prusky and he said, Catholic Health Association has a publication to encourage dioceses to begin and sustain health ministries, improving the lives of older adults through faith community partnerships, healing body, mind, and spirit. I helped co-write it. I worked with Julie Trocchio from CHA. Also, I teach a 22 hour, 22 hour 10 module online health minister certificate at Wellesley Theological Seminary for lay people and numerous professionals wanting to get involved in health ministry. We have over 300 oh. graduates. Oh, wow. I'd like to get that information from him, from you oh. that you just read. And this is Scott Hurd and what I will do, and thank you for that comment. And actually Julie Trocchio is also on the line today. So the two CHA um, authors of that um, are here. And what I can do is um, get the link to that document and put it in the chat box. And um, so everyone can access it and, and read okay. it. I'll do that right now. Okay. So. Any more comments? The Westberg Institute, well, as I say, the Westberg Institute that oversees this program has just joined up too with the Spiritual Care Association. So um, they've kind of incorporated them. So now I, I, they go by both names, but um, I think Spiritual Care Association is what their primary name is going to be now. And that just happened within the last, I think, six months. And oh, I see. This is Scott. I'm trying to figure out how to put this in the chat box. And there we go. Everyone should be able to see it, I hope. Oh. Oh, yeah. Yeah, here it is. There we go. All right, we'll give it maybe 20 more seconds. If anyone has a, a last comment or question that they want to push through, feel free. Uh, I think I got disconnected. <laughs> oh. you're, you're, you're still on. Oh, okay. <laughs> I just, I got the screen that says that was connected to it, but I don't have anything showing. So, okay. And something came through from, uh, Barbara, you mentioned being able to uh, to provide, or provide relief for caregivers. Yeah, we have people that come in um, that maybe just want to go and house sit for a few hours. Um, 
because they, maybe they take care of a family member that has Alzheimer's 24 seven or something. So we just have someone that may go in and sit with them for a couple of hours and give them relief so they can go to lunch with a friend or, you know, run some personal errands, things like that. That hasn't been a big, a big area of our business. Most of them have been um, just going and visiting with them and talking to them for a few hours and or for an hour or so. And you know, they just enjoy the company because if they don't have family around here, especially with this pandemic now, it's really been hard. And she said, "Where do you get the caregivers from?" They would be people from within the parish that volunteered that want to do this. And then we would put them through some training that would um, include like infection control and communication, um, conf the confidentiality, and just how to interact with them and things to look for. We have a whole page of things that we went through with our um, with some of our parishioners that wanted to do this. And they're not, I mean, it's all voluntary, so they know they're not going to be paid for it, but a lot of them just have time. Some of them might just want to send out cards to people after, as they're discharged from the hospital to let them know we're there thinking about them. The caregivers that we send out to just homes are not going to be ones that are going to provide any personal care or anything for them. So they don't have to be trained as a like CNA or anything. And then um, Pat says, could you please include the items you cover with your res your res your respite volunteers prior to their providing respite? We um, at our parish, we don't have any like respite volunteers per se that go in um, end of life. Um, we do cover that in our course though, and it is, uh, we do talk about that and things that can be done. But we don't have anybody um, in the parish that's really trained in that to, to go in and talk to people that are in a hospice situation. We have one, uh, person in our parish who works in a hospice situation, but it is in her as a job. Okay. And then they say, they say those sitting with people are providing respite. Oh, well, okay. Deborah, this is Scott, just following up on that, you know, talking about someone sitting with uh, a person perhaps facing end of life issues. Uh, what collaboration is there with Clergy. Well, usually when, uh, yeah, usually I recommend if we I visit with them and they're at that point, I usually ask if I can have notify our priest and I have our priest contact them and visit with them first and talk to them because I don't, you know, where I'm not in a situation or trained to be able to discuss that. So, uh, and they may have questions that are way beyond what I could even answer. So. That or we've had, like I said, one time I had a seminarian go with me out to some of these visits and they talked to him, asked him a lot of the questions. But it's a good way to screen for um, people that the priest needs to see. And sometimes it helps relieve the priest of some of their time too. So we can go visit people for him so he can you know, because they're busy as it is, and then determine which ones he really probably needs to talk to. Anybody else? All righty, well, thank you everybody so much for joining the webinar today. Um, and we have uh, a couple other webinars here upcoming. Hope you can make those as well. We'll be sending out email blasts about them. Um, just want to thank our presenters. Thank you so much. And remember, there'll be a recording uh, to your emails in the next couple days, um, as well as on the in the members portal um, in the parish ministry section. So.
closing us out and thank you so much and thank you see you guys later hopefully all right okay. bye bye bye, -bye.